in order that any religious movement can grow and thrive and survive, it needs to have a beating intellectual heart. It needs to have a distinctive voice of its own, one which comes out of its own historical experience. And so uh, I'm delighted that um, Rabbi Dr. Tony Bayfield, Rabbi Professor Tony Bayfield, um, who is uh, our distinctive voice, who does provide that intellectual beating heart for us, is going to uh, give a uh, sermon this evening. Very nice indeed to be back. My granddaughter Francesca, aka Chessie, my favourite granddaughter, I'm your only granddaughter, Grandpa, has just begun a music degree at Dunham. She's a singer and a flautist who made her debut in the Aylith Kids Choir more than 14 years ago. Some of the more mature among you will appreciate from my service leading days, it's so confirming to know that my musical talents have been passed on. A few weeks ago, Chessie confided in me that she didn't enjoy going to concerts of lesser-known early Baroque music played on original instruments, and that all she really wanted to do was to make music herself. I responded by saying that I thought there were many young painters who might be very happy to go to Florence but not to spend several days walking studiously round the Uffizi. They just wanted to paint. And I then confided in her that all those years ago, I hadn't been so keen on the daily grind of classes at the Leo Beck College myself. And what I wanted to do was to be out in my congregation in Weybridge. I'd late, and I, I added that I'd later come to the conclusion that my rabbinic education was probably necessary and even, with hindsight, beneficial in a way that's only taken me 45 years to recognize. I started work on being Jewish today confronting the real issues more than eight years ago after I stepped down as head of the movement for Reform Judaism, left it for several years while I concentrated on another book and came back to it two years ago. I was surprised to find how big a part the Leo Beck College played in the book particularly those previously dismissed days as a student there back in the second half of the last century. For the first time, I began to examine the complex nature of the culture shock, or rather, culture shock, I experienced. The Leobeck College named after the rabbi who led German Jewry from 1933 to 1945, had been founded little more than 10 years earlier by another refugee German rabbi, Werner van der Zyl, rabbi of this synagogue before he moved on to West London, where the Leo Beck College began in a room on the second floor plus three small cheder classrooms renting for four days a week. It was one of the great upheavals of my life to come from reading a rational, cerebral subject, English law, at a large and long-established university and walk into the smallest possible institution 
little more than a sketch on the back of a cigarette packet, the all-pervasive clothes invading smoke from cigarettes is my strongest memory of all, Rabbi Heimer. <laughs> I had to sit at a child's desk and be chided for not having prepared with sufficient meticulousness. That would have been a culture shock enough, but it wasn't the culture shock which really knocked me sideways. It was the culture shock. Almost all the accents were German. Na na na, why have you not prepared, Mr. Bailey? said my Bible teacher, Dr. Ellen Lippmann from Berlin. Where on earth am I? I said to myself and to anybody else who would listen. I told myself I'd come to the Lea Beck College to find the roots of my fundamental self-defining values, which, as the, ther as the therapist sitting next to you will tell you, will only be part of the story. But I also expected in the course of my internment at 33 Seymour Place, that my questions about God would be addressed. In actuality, God didn't seem to be very much present or of any great concern. But at one point, I think it was in my second year, I was dispatched for a weekly class in a neat edgeware semi with Rabbi Dr. Ignaz Maybaum. Maybaum was one of the 35 German and Czech rabbis who were rescued, brought to this country, and were formative in the early days of the Reform Synagogues of Great Britain. Even though I couldn't relate to much of what he said, and some of what I did understand, I found utterly foreign, politically incorrect, and even shocking, Dr. Maybaum turned out to be almost as profound an influence on me as he was to Edgware-born graduate of the college, Rabbi Nicholas Delange, who went on to become professor of Hebrew and Jewish studies at Cambridge, and is Amos Oz's translator. And the other Leobeck College student he was to influence profoundly was your erstwhile rabbi and my rabbinic father and mentor, Dov Marmer. Maybaum was the first rabbi of what was then called Edgware and District Reform Synagogue, and it wasn't a match made in heaven. The founder members of Edgware were looking for a pragmatic English compromise with Jewish life and wanted reformed rules of practice. Maybaum represented the last flowering of the German Jewish liberala tradition, which is the key to this sermon. Maybaum understood very well who his new congregants were. And he told them so. Here he is in full combative flow. I can't do the accent, unfortunately. When a Jew becomes a member of a congregation, he does not ask of what kind of people the congregation consists. Such a question would be un-Jewish. The questions, are they as clever as I am? Are they, as the phrase runs, my cup of tea? Are they the social type which I prefer to another social type? Are all questions which must not be asked. That was giving it them with both barrels. And you may suspect the critique might have applied more widely than Edgware, and may even apply today. Maybaum and the refugee German Jews 
who had once been bricks in the fabric of the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, the German liberaler traditions shattered broken fortress in Berlin, and who continued that tradition by building the Leo Beck College, faded from my acutely disorientated and disturbed consciousness when I got what I wanted and moved down to Weybridge full time. The first sign of any serious consideration of my relationship to such foreigners came decades later, probably when I started doing some work on our family tree. My mother's maiden name is Man, M-A-N-N. We need to ask you some security questions. What's your mother's maiden name? Man. My mother was a man before she got married. But they never laugh, and neither does my mother. I discovered that my grandfather's uncle who was Shmiyak Tsingur in several synagogues in Przemysl, in the farthest reaches of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, had two of his sons tutored in secular subjects. But, sad to say, not his youngest son, my grandfather, who had to go into the family business, they were Shochtim. One of the boys, Isaac Mann, went to university in Vienna, gained a doctorate there, became a Verbrenter Zionist following Herzl, and in the 1920s settled in Jerusalem. He worked for the JNF, meticulously editing and correcting all their publications. Only he knew the final details of Hebrew grammar, and in his spare time, he translated Marx and Das Kapital into Hebrew. The younger brother came here to study at Jews College. He lived with my great-grandfather and my grandfather, beginning when my grandfather was nine or ten, in the East End. But he was encouraged by Chief Rabbi Hertz to take a degree in Hebrew studies at London University and he forsook the United Synagogue Ministry and became an expert in Geniza studies going off to teach at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati where he was a square German peg in a round classical American reform whole, and published books of meticulous but completely unreadable Jewish scholarship. He wasn't a man, but a man, part of the German Jewish tradition, who clearly, like his Zionist Marxist brother, what we fondly or not so fondly derive, deride as a yekka. People who've worked with me will smile ruefully, shrug their shoulders, and say something to the effect that apples don't fall far from the apple bow. <laughs> the next stage in my self-questioning came after I was asked to be a judge for a Jewish book prize and we all readily agreed that the prize should go to a German-born Israeli scholar called Amos Elon for his book, The Pity of It All. He tells the story of German Jewry from 1743, the year in which Moses Mendelssohn went to Berlin and ushered German Jewry into the post-enlightenment German Jewish world, and it ends in 1933, with its destruction, heralded by the election of Adolf Hitler. It's a deep and compassionate tribute 
to a dream of integration and acceptance doomed to failure. If diaspora couldn't work even in the cultured heart of Europe, the world of Goethe and Beethoven, it can never work, is Amos Salon's thesis. But is he right? The key that finally unlocked the closed door to my experience more than half a century ago at the Leo Beck College and helped me to come to terms with who I am and perhaps who we are came not from a prize-winning book but from, from one of the most obscure monographs that only would-be academics like me would ever read. The book is by an Australian Jewish academic a former research fellow in English called Ned Kertois. And Kertois brought me back to the Jewish liberal tradition, liberal with a small L, I hasten to add, or rather liberala tradition, and to the obscure term elective affinity. Elective affinity is actually the title of one of Goethe's novels. In German, it's such a long word that you couldn't get it on the back of two football shirts, make them Niles in Jahat out. What the phrase elective affinity came to mean for the German Jewish liberala tradition was the imperative of engagement by the Jew with the culture in which she or he lives with the objective of contributing to change in that culture whilst recognizing that in that process not just the Jew but Judaism would also be changed. Kertois defines the liberala tradition as an energetic worldview which seeks to accommodate the vitality and evolving nature of Jewish life in diaspora by emphasizing that in preserving the ethical kernel of genuine monotheism, Jews have an exemplary role to play in world history. Ethical kernel of genuine monotheism. <laughs> Values and beliefs. Judaism and its understanding of God. The liberala tradition is about social, cultural and political involvement in society, however hostile to change or just plain hostile that society may be and realizing that the wider culture has something to give, not just to the Jew, but to Judaism as well. After the Shoah, and widespread but hollow declarations of never again, amidst the resurgent of anti-Semitism both in Europe and here, both on the hard left and the hard right, that you and I destined never to learn? Or do we still have a role, come what may, on whatever the price? Elective affinity. Involvement not just economically and socially and for security and self-protection, but also culturally, intellectually, ethically, spiritually, theologically, seeking to collaborate with others in changing society, knowing that Judaism will also be changed. For that is the nature of our resolutely forward-looking journey. 
now rolled back the film 50 years to the Leo Beck College, founded by Rabbi Werner van der Zyl, and populated by the few surviving fractured bricks of the Hochschule in Berlin, among them my beloved Bible teacher, Ellen Lippmann, and my revered theology teacher, Ignaz Mayhaar. Dr. Lippmann, refugee from Heidelberg in Berlin, regularly remonstrated with me. You're so English, Mr. Bailey. Surprisingly, I managed to refrain from saying, and you're so German, Dr. Lippmann, which would have hurt her enormously. I never appreciated the privilege and pathos of the experience. Sitting at the feet of half a dozen surviving fragments of an intensely rich and productive chapter in Jewish history, utterly, brutally destroyed. Such was my insecurity and immaturity. Maybaum was a major influence on me because he spoke about theological subjects using reason and in language I could sometimes understand. I realized how politically incorrect he was, how distorted were his pictures of Christianity and Islam, but I felt he was entitled to hold such views. Above all, he asked theological questions without fear or faith. So God, it seems, has a wicked sense of humor, more in the contemporary usage of the word wicked than the tradition. God shakes my very English pragmatic rationalism by the scruff of its intellectual neck, exposing me to a European tradition I'm utterly repelled by, only to reveal to me late in my journey that I am of those who I was repelled by, and to show me that the reading of history the Jewish world has not chosen for prizes may be the only road open to us if Judaism and not just Jewish identity, but to survive and go forward. And if that contains even a grain of truth, what might it mean for the priorities of our synagogues? How prepared are we to consider what it means for being Jewish today? In other words, how prepared are we to reconsider Judaism and the Jewish God? How open are we to confronting the real issues? We are going to turn together to page 300.